Attending my wife's office party had its pros and cons. On the one hand, I was glad to have the opportunity to demonstrate my driving skills to an opponent. But the downside was that the more I accelerated, the faster I arrived at my destination. The gathering took place in a secluded cabin located in the middle of the forest, and it was necessary to drive 20 miles to it. This route was notable for the absence of any interference such as stop signs, traffic lights, or congested roads. It was just an open space, eagerly awaiting the prowess of my Dodge. However, this also meant the absence of gas stations and shops along the route. Since our daughters got married, Donna and I have been drifting apart. It's the exact opposite of what I was hoping for, but it seems fate had other plans. Despite her lack of interest, Donna insisted that I accompany her to the wedding ceremony. It used to be her solo appearance. We had different preferences regarding alcohol. Donna liked to drink, and I didn't have any addiction to it, occasionally indulging in beer. Besides, she had a social charm that I lacked. Over time, I had a sneaking suspicion that she was having an affair, but at the moment I began to treat it indifferently. I believe that this was the reason for our separation from each other. I patiently searched for a way out of an unsatisfactory relationship, desperately trying to find a solution. I must admit that my wife's decision to look for greener pastures may have been influenced by my peculiar minimalism. I come from a modest family where my brothers and I had significantly fewer values than our peers. It resembled the lifestyle of the Amish tribe, devoid of religious beliefs. I wasn't naive. I understood how the ordinary world works. But it was unacceptable for me to comply with its norms. I recognized the importance of staying out of debt, prioritizing paying bills and saving money for the future. Minimalism didn't require fanaticism, but it did require self-discipline. By allowing myself a few indulgences, I was able to easily blend in with the majority and seem like an ordinary person. Marriage and family were my main problems. It turned out to be quite difficult for me to find a woman who could accept my peculiarities and appreciate my personality. But Donna, who received a similar upbringing and was accustomed to a modest lifestyle, was able to put up with my quirks. Over time, she gradually became less frugal, which I didn't really like, but I understood the reasons for this, especially after the birth of our daughters. We made these changes in order to fit into social norms and not look out of place. To do this, we purchased a modest but functional house and updated our wardrobe to more presentable outfits. Donna, in particular, tried to style her hair sometimes and became quite adept at taking care of herself and applying makeup. Our technological devices also reflected this desire to match, because we owned two smartphones of last year's models. As time passed, the children grew up, and Donna decided to go to work. She got a job in an office where, unfortunately, they paid the minimum wage, but it was necessary for our financial stability. Commuting became necessary, so we decided to purchase a small Honda Civic for her, repeating my previous choice. With her salary, Donna was able to cover car-related expenses, including meals and other necessary expenses. Let me introduce myself. I am William Smith, the proud owner of a brand new wardrobe. Although my name may be the most common, I have found satisfaction in my life. I currently work for a local company specializing in the production of industrial compressors. The work itself may seem monotonous to some, but I fell in love with it. The position I hold and the salary I receive always meet my expectations, and I am satisfied. From time to time I was given opportunities for promotion, but I deliberately refused them. I kept this decision to myself, without saying a word to Donna. Moreover, I managed to hide my second passion from my wife, a secret that I considered necessary to preserve peace in my marriage. At the heart of these actions is my conviction that saving money for retirement is wise. Therefore, whenever possible, I invested in gold, buying one ounce of Krug Errand at a time. There were over 30 items in my secure basement vault, and this was just the beginning of my collection. In the end, I bought a Dodge Challenger, feeling a sense of liberation. Donna, on the other hand, excelled in her role at Gilbert Industrial. 
She constantly received decent bonuses and promotions. At first, she often discussed her work, but gradually her enthusiasm waned. Now she rarely mentions her work or the colleagues she communicates with. I felt that something was wrong, but I couldn't figure out the reason. This evening I was hoping to get a deeper understanding of the situation. This event can be called a real holiday. This event, which stretched over the whole weekend, made me doubt my own presence. Having previously met with all her companions, none of whom I had a favorable opinion of, I felt like an outsider. When we turned off the highway into Holbrook, I finally had a chance to unleash the full potential of the applicant. Donna seemed concerned about the speed, but refrained from voicing her displeasure. Although I was well aware that I was speeding, I couldn't bring myself to worry. Bill, why are you in such a hurry? We still have enough time to arrive. Maybe we should slow down? Personally, I have no desire to get to my destination. I'm sure you know that I initially had no desire to participate in this event. I just took this opportunity to clean the engine, as the car requires periodic running in. Please don't spoil my mood. This weekend is very important for my career. Why, you ask? Why is it so important for me to attend this corporate event? I can't understand. Why? Bill, it is very important that you understand the scale of my new role in the company so that you can give me the necessary attention and support so that I succeed in my work. I'm still confused. As soon as we get to our destination, I'm sure Mrs. Simpson will clarify everything for you. Marge Simpson, wife of company president Glenn Robertson, belonged to a family with a long heritage and traditional business practices. In the past, I have constantly supported you. So what was the reason for this turnaround? Well, my recent promotion involves a number of special responsibilities. According to Marge, it will be useful for you to gradually familiarize yourself with them in order to understand their complexity. Although it may be difficult at first, she assured me that you will understand eventually. When we arrived at the cottage, excitement coursed through my veins. It didn't take much intelligence to figure out what Donna wanted to say. The upcoming weekend promises to be exciting. When we arrived, Donna confidently entered the mansion leaving me to carry the bags. I couldn't help feeling submissive. Hey, Mr. Smith, what impressive wheels, Toby Wallace remarked. After greeting Toby, the only diligent employee in their office, I asked how he was feeling. Toby cordially introduced me to his wife, Bonnie, and we saw that they were sitting on the porch, seemingly apart from the rest of the crowd gathered inside. My gaze swept across the parking lot, finding about 16 cars and a battered car parked at the far end. Involved in the conversation, we switched to discussing the applicant. Curious, I asked Toby about their decision to stay outside instead of joining the others indoors with Bonnie. Mr. Smith, these people don't fit into our usual crowd. We were going to leave early, but Mrs. Simpson insists that we stay. We arrived earlier than scheduled today to help organize everything. But the suppliers had already left about an hour ago. You need to give an explanation. What's going on? It seems that there are suspicions, although the specific details are unclear to me. I don't want to cause trouble, but it seems to me that this may concern your wife. Will you stay all weekend? No, that's why I parked my car on the side of the road. I felt relieved knowing that I wouldn't have to worry about our departure. Every moment the situation became more and more intriguing. I should probably bring it all to our room. Please let me know before you leave, okay? Of course, Mr. Smith, be careful and circumspect. Don't make any stupid decisions. Fortunately, I only had two small bags. Upon entering the house, Mrs. Simpson caught my attention, smiled and waved. As I was walking up the stairs, I noticed Donna waiting for me at the top with an expression of annoyance on her face. Obviously, my lateness did not go unnoticed. Bill, just in time, she exclaimed. We have a few hours to prepare for tonight. Freshen up and put on something presentable. It's going to be an outstanding evening, and I want everything to be perfect. With these words, she asked for some time alone to collect her thoughts, suggesting that she take a short walk around the house. I'll be back before you know it. As I left the room, 
a wide grin spread across my face. While I was walking, a light breeze brought a pleasant coolness. After a quick calculation, I determined that there were exactly 16 cars in sight. Most of them were luxury Mercedes, as well as several Jaguars and an elegant Lexus. Interestingly, four of these cars had out-of-state license plates. I couldn't help wondering how a woman in my wife's position could compare to people of such a high class. After all, we considered ourselves to be people of a completely different level. Something didn't add up. When I noticed Toby and Bonnie loading things into the truck, I waved and went over to them to start a conversation. It looks like Mrs. Simpson has given you permission to leave, I said. To be honest, we're leaving soon, Bonnie chimed in, expressing her concern about the current situation. Although Toby was thinking of staying, I managed to convince him otherwise, she hastily added. Would you be so kind as to do me a small favor and stay here until the evening reception is over? I find myself a little worried and would really appreciate your presence. I don't understand the current situation at all, but I don't like it. It's often said that great minds have similar thoughts, don't you agree, Bonnie? Her face turned slightly red as my feeble attempt at a joke failed. I think we can handle it. At this point, there will be crustaceans and mollusks. Toby, I think I'll like it. I got dressed at my wife's insistence. No sooner had we reached the buffet than the hostess took my hand and led me to a secluded corner. We are glad that you have decided to join us tonight to express your support for Donna. This is an important stage in her professional career, and your continued support is very important to her. A substantial increase in salary and benefits is indeed noteworthy, and I believe you will find it quite satisfactory. Excuse my curiosity, but could you clarify exactly what role we are talking about? Donna was a little evasive when I asked about it, often brushing it off and offering to wait until the evening. Don't worry, William. I think she just wants to surprise you. But you still haven't answered my initial question. It looks like there is no official title yet. I suppose you can just call her a personal assistant, understand? By the way, the buffet looks very appetizing. I appreciate your clarification, Mrs. Simpson. Oh, please call me Marge. During the next hour, I tried all the dishes from the buffet. Donna was busy socializing with influential people, which allowed Toby, Bonnie, and me to enjoy some extra time together. We were just packing up when Mrs. Simpson showed up. Donna mentioned that you arrived tonight in your fancy sports car. I was wondering if you'd like to take us on a little booze trip. I replied with a smile and a nod. There are three cases of wine waiting for us at the ABC store in Holbrook, and they have already been paid for. All you have to do is stop by and pick them up. I don't expect any problems, but if you do, just give me a call. Don't forget to bring your phone with you. I appreciate your trust, Marge. I'll tell Donna and I'll go. As soon as she left, I turned my attention to Toby. Join me outside in five minutes. Donna responded to Mrs. Simpson's request with a simple smile and reminded her to take the phone. It's interesting how they both emphasized the same point. Toby, I need your help. He grinned when I handed him the keys to the applicant's car. Are you really serious? Go to Holbrook and buy three cases of wine for Mrs. Simpson at ABC. I have a suspicion that there may be some kind of problem that will lead to a potential delay, if you get my point. Toby's smile widened and he nodded in agreement. Sure. Here's my phone, I said, handing it over. Just put it on the dashboard and remember if he calls, don't answer. Whatever happens, don't turn it off. Toby paused to make sure there were no more questions. And how long should we stay away? What is it? He asked. Toby's instructions were clear. At least two hours, and don't forget to replenish your gas reserves before returning, I instructed, and then added, enjoy it. Despite the slight coolness in the air, I prudently put on a comfortable jacket. Now I could only wait and watch. Taking a strategically advantageous position on the back porch, I had a good view of almost the entire interior of the house. I wish I had thought ahead and brought a thermos of coffee with me. 
It would have been incredibly useful in this situation, but I didn't expect to need it. In order to observe unnoticed, I managed to find a convenient place where I could look inside without attracting attention. It was obvious that Donna was the center of everyone's attention. She radiated magnetic charm, mesmerizing others with her infectious smile, laughter, and periodic moments of embarrassment, reminiscent of the smiles of famous movie stars. After about 20 minutes, Mrs. Simpson and Donna decided to carefully examine Donna's mobile phone, which immediately made me understand their intentions. They were checking my location. Fortunately, Toby's help brought me closer to my destination, Holbrook. Mrs. Simpson raised her hand, and a smile spread across their faces. Unfortunately, I couldn't decipher the words she said, but the room was filled with a palpable sense of approval. It was like silent applause. Glenn Robertson Simpson walked over to Donna and intertwined their fingers. Together they went up the front stairs, pausing for a moment. In a triumphant gesture, he raised both hands in the air, and laughter burst from their lips. As they continued to climb, cheers rang out in the hall. There was still an hour and a half left before the applicant returned, and I made a conscious choice in favor of the simple joys of life. My trusty penknife, made of durable steel and with a razor-sharp blade, has always been by my side. After looking around the neighborhood, I decided to start working with the cars closest to the house, taking my time, without any sense of urgency. After making sure that no traces of my actions would remain, I carefully hid each valve stem in a secure jacket pocket, determined not to miss a single item and not spoil the Simpsons' pristine driveway. I still had almost an hour left. What should I do with this time? Of the four cars, all were locked, except for those parked next to the cottage. I started the search by taking down the sheets of notes. Some were tucked into sun visors, most were in glove boxes. Although I wasn't sure of their usefulness, I held on to them, thinking they might come in handy later. When Toby was 30 minutes away from returning, I came to the conclusion that it was necessary to remove the valve rods from the spare tires. Having access to the cars, I also got access to their trunks. In 20 minutes, I managed to purchase 10 more valves. Interestingly, the two cars did not have spare tires. It may have been immature and corny, but I got a little sense of satisfaction. I must admit that I preferred to use mean and malicious tactics, because I was not prone to conflict. My actions were far from noble and courageous. I left this role to the alpha males. As a result, the applicant returned after 20 minutes. Toby and Bonnie seemed to enjoy the trip, confirming my suspicions about the deliberate delay at the ABC store. Surprisingly, during their absence, no one called me on my mobile. Taking matters into my own hands, I turned off the device and took out the SIM card. It was obvious that they couldn't wait to get home without delay. Thanking Toby, I wished him a safe journey, and strongly advised him to find an alternative job as soon as possible. Undoubtedly, the cases of wine they had purchased must have been very expensive. It turned out to be an easy task to solve this problem. I conveniently placed all three boxes on the porch of the cottage. The last thing I wanted was to face charges of theft. When I returned home, the trip was undoubtedly calm. The things in the house were of little value to me, just a handful of personal documents, a laptop, and a few Krugerrands. At first I thought about setting fire to the house before leaving, but in the end, I refused because I did not want to perpetuate Donna as a martyr. So. Two hours later, I set off. I saw no reason to leave her an ordinary note or an engagement ring. It seemed to me that she should find out for herself. I was not motivated by haste or a specific goal. I went on a two-day journey, taking my time to reach my goal. It was Monday morning and I called work to warn them. I asked for my last paycheck to be sent to my parents in Carlisle. They expressed dissatisfaction with my sudden departure. And although I apologized, I chose not to give any explanation. A hearty breakfast is always guaranteed at the Waffle Iron. On the way, I bought a newspaper from a local merchant. Looking through the ads, I came across a tempting job that needed help at the nearest grocery store. In particular, 
a person was required who would be responsible for replenishing shelves in the late hours, from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Intrigued, I decided to explore the market after I had breakfast. Located in a vibrant and diverse area of Chattanooga, the market was surrounded by charming old cottages and several mobile homes. Although a cozy trailer would have been enough, I longed for a more substantial improvement in my living conditions. While searching, I suddenly came across a sign announcing the rental of an apartment in the garage. Although I had not yet been interested in the issue of employment, I did not want to miss the opportunity to rent an apartment in the garage. The rental price did not include the garage itself, but after offering to pay an additional $50 a month, they agreed to grant my request. The apartment was modest, consisted of one bedroom and had no shower. The furniture was arranged haphazardly, a bed, a chest of drawers, and a table with chairs. Despite these disadvantages, the rent was reasonable and the location was convenient. I decided to take it, even though I knew that I still had to solve the bathroom issue. On the other hand, having a garage was a relief for my applicant. But in the supermarket, the situation was a little more complicated. Although they had many applicants, it was inconvenient for them to leave them alone in the store overnight. I was honest with the owner and explained my circumstances without embellishing anything. In the end, it was my willingness to take on small jobs without any advantages that helped convince them to hire me. I was able to negotiate a dollar discount from the original price without having to provide my social security number. Both sides were satisfied with the deal. The apartment was conveniently located a 10-minute walk away. I spent the rest of the day settling into my new home. The host kindly shared his internet access code, which was a nice gesture. A quick visit to the nearest Goodwill store led to the purchase of necessary kitchen utensils and a compact microwave oven. In addition, I now have bed linen and cleaning supplies. In the evening, I decided to terminate my insurance policies. The idea of dealing with banks and credit cards no longer appealed to me, as I was afraid of the potential harm they could do. The fact that both of our daughters were already married made it easier for me to leave, as they found their own way in life. Although there were no grandchildren yet, I believed that it would not be long before they appeared. Taking a deep breath, I contacted my daughter Lara and assured her of my well-being. I asked her to be ready to help her mother if necessary, without revealing any details about my departure that Donna had hidden from her. I promised myself to break the news to Linda, my sister. After deleting all incoming calls from my wife, I decided to turn off the phone again. The idea of taking a shower came to mind, but it could wait until tomorrow. Despite everything, not everything went perfectly. I urgently needed to find a safe place to store the gold. I understood that its value might not be significant to others, but it was of great importance to me. For some strange reason, I chose a safe in Huntsville, Alabama, hoping that it would not be connected to me in Chattanooga. Of course, my assumption turned out to be completely wrong, but I still wanted to try, even if it meant futile attempts. I decided to endure the almost two-hour trip, despite its duration. Although the garage door in the apartment seemed reliable enough, I decided to install an additional deadbolt and a strong lock to ensure my safety and protection. Adapting to my new job was pretty easy, and I quickly got into the routine. At first a colleague worked next to me for the first three nights, but then I was entrusted to handle everything on my own. Within two weeks I successfully completed all my duties. To solve the problem with the shower, I chose a subscription to the Planet Fitness Club worth $20 per month which became a practical solution. I started my work shift at 10 p.m. and finished it at 6 a.m. After that, I would go for a 20-minute jog or a 30-minute walk to get to the planet. At first, I only used the shower, but gradually I began to include exercise equipment in my regime. By the end of the first month, I found myself spending almost two hours a day working out at the gym. As a result, my overall well-being improved and I lost weight. Although I never considered myself an obese person, I had some flabbiness. Despite this, I was happy with my new job. Although it was monotonous, at the same time it gave a sense of uniqueness. 
It's hard to put into words, but I'm sure you'll get the gist of what I'm trying to convey. I fulfilled my duties and got privacy as a result. Choosing a gym was a wise decision on my part. I chose exercises that I liked and deliberately avoided those that I didn't like. Although I didn't have a TV, I had a used desktop computer with a great monitor. Although I didn't cook much, I involuntarily noticed small changes in my eating habits. I found myself gravitating towards the keto diet. After three months, my health improved and I managed to lose a few pounds. It's time to turn to your daughters again. So I decided to call Linda. Hello Linda, this is your father speaking. It's been a while. We were all worried about you. Are you all right? Don't worry about me. I've always been able to take care of myself. I just wanted to check on your mom. Fortunately, Linda informed me that mom was doing well. It looks like she got a promotion at work and loves her job very much. But she's incredibly mad at you. According to her, you dumped her during the celebration of her promotion and stormed out of the house like a moody child. Those were her exact words. She also mentioned that you are jealous of her achievements. Unfortunately, I have to inform you that I can't provide any additional information until she wants to tell you the truth. That's all I know at the moment. In addition, she mentioned that things have become more difficult without your financial support. But she believes that she can cope with the increased income. Personally, I am sincerely happy for her. By the way, did she by any chance share any details about her new job with you? I didn't say anything when Linda mentioned that she earns more and travels a lot. After a short pause, she asked if I would be coming home for Christmas. Without hesitation, I replied that she didn't need to send anything for Lara and me. Instead, we would prefer that she attend the festivities. I apologized for the abruptness and said it was time for me to leave. I asked her to say hi to Laura on my behalf and said goodbye to her. A feeling of melancholy came over me. I felt that my daughters did not understand the situation and considered me the sole culprit of all the problems. Although it was unpleasant for me, I did not feel obliged to justify myself. It was obvious that my wife had no remorse, which made me feel a little melancholy. Judging by her daughter's statements, Donna seemed to be thriving without my presence, and I wondered why she wanted me to come home. As the weekend went on, I found myself sinking into depression, which led to an increase in beer consumption. Over time, I noticed positive progress in my work. I did a great job with my tasks, and to my surprise, I got a promotion. The company has given me full autonomy in the performance of my duties. In a short period of time, I have successfully optimized and improved the replenishment system. Although the store's computer system has already coped with this task, they were surprised by my manual input. The living conditions fully met my needs and were well within my budget. Over time, I noticed weight loss and gradual muscle growth. But when I looked at my embossed abs in the mirror in the right light, I had doubts. In search of a new look, I decided to give up shaving and let my hair grow long enough to tie it in a small ponytail. This transformation seemed to change my whole image, and I was a little doubtful about the changes that had happened to me. As I worked out at the gym, they gradually became more manageable and took up more and more time. Surprisingly, I also found that I had formed connections with several people at the gym. Although these connections were acquaintances rather than close friends, I remained careful when dealing with women because I wanted to avoid possible complications. On the contrary, I felt at ease with the guys, and we often exchanged phrases lightly. Nevertheless, against the background of the usual camaraderie, an unexpected and peculiar alliance arose. Her name was Harry, or at least that's what everyone called her. Harry was not particularly sociable and rarely entered into conversations with anyone. I turned out to be an anomaly among the usual crowd. She packed diligently every morning and devoted at least two hours to her rigorous training. Unlike the elegant practice of fashionable yoga, her exercises were intense and demanding. Judging by her appearance, her age was about 45 years old. She had a strong character and often wore sweatpants and a hoodie. While other women proudly showed off their figures in tight latex and revealing outfits devoid of hair, 
I was the only man in this confined space with whom she started a conversation, or even glanced at. But I never encouraged her attention. I did not take any part in her departure. I will clarify. I must admit that I felt somewhat flattered. Time flew by, and several months passed without any communication from the daughters and wife. I just couldn't find the strength to initiate it myself. I have traveled to Huntsville several times to add to my Krugerrand collection, but then everything went awry. William, can I talk to you for a minute? This was not a typical start to a conversation with Harry. She addressed me as William. After all the boys addressed me as Bill, I realized that she had never called me by my first name, but I didn't object. Is there anything I can help you with? I asked, sincerely wanting to lend a helping hand. To my surprise, she answered in the affirmative. We settled down on the nearest bench, finding comfort in her arms. She explained that she had an important corporate meeting on Friday evening and needed an escort. After assuring me that she would take care of all the expenses, she kindly asked me to accompany her. Realizing that I didn't have a driver's license, she generously offered transportation. I'm able to cover the expenses. I hesitated, and she quickly took care of everything. I deeply apologize. Did I do or say something inappropriate? No, not at all. I just have a few secrets or personal problems that I haven't, figuratively speaking, shared. If you can ignore them, I'll be happy to help you. Well, what are the obstacles? Firstly, I am currently married. It's a little unexpected, I understand. No, it's not weird at all. I think I can have a free evening without any problems. I am glad that you have managed to resolve this issue, she said, beaming. By the way, is there anything else you want me to do? Should I shave? William, I appreciate your beard and hair, but to be honest, you look a little unkempt. Would you mind if my stylist looked at you on Friday afternoon? She's quite talented. At the mention of the stylist, she smiled again, and although I groaned, I finally nodded in agreement. That's how my acquaintance with Harry, a professional in his field, began. Harriet Parker, a barrister by profession. And so on Tuesday, I got to Jazz Banks. Although it was not the most prestigious institution, it was still significantly superior to all the places I had visited before. Her visit had been prearranged by Harry. After walking around the store, I chose two pairs of trousers and two business jackets, as well as a pair of shirts and several ties. Feeling a slight tension, I impulsively added two turtlenecks to the growing stack. I've always liked turtlenecks, and I thought they would complement the suits well. Fortunately, Harry has already made sure to pay for everything. Returning home, I made a short stop to buy a fresh pair of decent shoes and underwear. My recent weight loss has caused the need for new underwear. The shoes I picked up looked like loafers and exuded cool style. The meeting with the stylist which I scheduled for Friday turned out to be very pleasant. The person next to me was friendly and skilled in his work. They expertly styled my facial hair into a neatly trimmed goatee and turned my ponytail into a modified mallet hairstyle, with the back strands left slightly longer. Although I'm not sure about the accuracy of the term, it certainly added an interesting touch. He assured me that taking care of him would require less effort. I appreciated it. He didn't go into details about Harry, but mentioned that I was lucky. At six o'clock sharp, Harry drove up to the apartment. She stayed in the car, making a short beep, the presence of Alexis seemed out of place in my neighborhood. Wearing a gray jacket and a turtleneck, I thought I looked pretty stylish, although I had no reason to compare. I was grateful to her for getting behind the wheel, as the city roads were unfamiliar to me. Let's discuss something before we enter the building, I suggested. Could you give me detailed instructions for tonight? The first part of the evening will most likely be devoted to communication, but you don't have to worry about that. Many of those present are likely to turn out to be pretentious and too preoccupied with sensual pleasures, and it is better to stay away from them if possible. The most important thing is that you stay by my side and prevent any clashes with these snobs. Try to blend in with the crowd without attracting too much attention, but don't let anyone take advantage of you. 
Also, make sure that I always have a drink in my hand, whether it's ginger ale or mineral water. Maintain a friendly and pleasant demeanor throughout the night, and try to keep your composure even in difficult situations. I considered myself a person who is in a romantic relationship. I have no experience in such matters. But can you pretend? Despite my doubts, I am ready to agree. But I have one important question. Will there be food at the event? I know that in about an hour we will be served a plate of chicken worth $500, accompanied by speeches. As soon as this event is over, they will suggest something else. By the way, I have to say that you look great. Watching her, I couldn't shake the feeling of strangeness. The beginning of the evening unfolded exactly as she described it. To my surprise, I found that my role turned out to be much less difficult than expected. The venue was teeming with eligible bachelors dressed in lavish suits and sporting huge watches. Harry looked flawless, and it was obvious that many of them were aware of her single status. Many people tried to start short conversations with her, carefully assessing her interest. At the same time, I couldn't help but cast quick sidelong glances at them. To my surprise, it worked in the style of Charles Bronson. Every time I left her, a horde of vultures flew at her, ready to offer her another drink. She passed them to me easily, as if it were the order of the day. Harry looked at me several times, a knowing smile playing on his lips. In the end, we sat down at the table, and 300 chicken dinners materialized out of nowhere in front of us. It was an amazing sight. I may not be the most fastidious eater, but it was a whole new level of suffering. The thought of $500 did not leave me. Harry, who was sitting next to me, leaned over and whispered, William, don't you want to escape from this place? Without saying a word, I got up from my seat, gently took her hand, and together we quietly left. No one even seemed to notice our departure. When we got to the garage, she playfully kicked off her shoes and casually handed me the keys to the Lexus. Find us some proper food, William, she asked. Twenty minutes later, we found ourselves at Hillbilly Villas, where we had a hearty meal, washed down with a refreshing beer. While we were enjoying the meal, one thing caught our attention, her evening. Moreover, she looked completely at ease despite being barefoot. Soon everything returned to normal. The time spent with Harry that evening was pleasant, although it did not lead to any intimate moments. Our regular relationship at the gym continued without any disruptions. Three weeks have passed, and Harry needed another couple to meet. Naturally, I agreed to this request. It was my duty to explain the situation to the boss, and he took it with humor. Given the circumstances, he assured me that there was no need to ask for permission to leave, just to leave a note. In fact, he said that I was responsible for managing my time and should approach it accordingly. Our second evening was similar to the first, only this time there was not enough food, and there was more booze. Throughout the evening she was constantly approached by men, each of whom presented a new drink. My role seemed to be to collect and throw away these unwanted glasses. There was one particularly unpleasant person among the crowd who managed to push me to the limit. In a moment of disappointment, I took him aside and calmly warned him that further harassment of my fiancé would be unacceptable, and made it clear that I was ready to defend her honor if necessary. After our conversation, he disappeared for the rest of the evening, like many others like him. It was amazing to realize that I had unwittingly earned a reputation as a force to be reckoned with. After the event, we decided to treat ourselves to a delicious sushi dinner. After consuming delicious $40 sashimi, our evening came to a delightful conclusion filled with platonic enjoyment. But just two days later, Harry caught me off guard while I was rowing. Why the hell didn't you tell me about our engagement? I felt awkward when a colleague suddenly asked this question. When she didn't wait for my answer, she just smiled. In search of clarification, I dialed Laura's number and found out that Donna was avoiding her and Linda. All Laura could find out was that Donna travels a lot, leaving a lot of unknowns. There were often guests in the house, and I asked about her mother's divorce status. But she was in the dark. 
It's been a few weeks since he and Linda last talked to Donna. Strangely, for some unknown reason, anger flared up in me. Each time I drank more and more bottles, and my mood deteriorated. The next day, I sent 74 valve rods to Glenn Simpson of Gilbert Industries, accompanied by a short message thanking him for a pleasant evening. More than a year has passed since that meeting. Although I was sure of his memories, I decided to skip the gym that day due to a lingering hangover. The next day, Harry suggested a plan, and I agreed to share all the details during our upcoming dinner. At six in the evening she picked me up, and we went to a place I didn't know Chris's steakhouse. Throughout the dinner she listened to me attentively, without making any judgments. I managed to get back to my apartment just in time for the start of the work shift. The next day, while at the gym, Harry asked me another question. She asked if I had any information about those who were present at the cottage that fateful night. When she found out that I had a list with the names and addresses of everyone present, her eyes sparkled with delight. After our class, she took me to her house, where I handed her an envelope with 12 car registration forms. She readily grabbed them and expressed her gratitude by kissing me gently on the cheek. During our conversation, Harry talked about the different types of lawyers, clarifying that her profession is a personal injury lawyer. Although she tried to explain all the subtleties of her profession, I just grinned and jokingly asked how much it might cost me. All I got in return was a kiss on the cheek. Three days later, my daughter Linda contacted me. Donna called her to find out about my whereabouts. Donna had some problems at work and she felt squeezed. She was unhappy and wanted to talk to me as soon as possible. But Linda refused to share any information with her. I was wondering if Glenn got the valve rods. I quickly dialed Harry's number and informed her that I would pick her up in 20 minutes. Her office, located in a prestigious shopping mall, exuded a restrained charm. Harry had never seen a Challenger before, but the roar of its engine aroused the curiosity of several onlookers who came out of her workplace as she approached the car. Walking around the car, I kindly opened the door for her, exchanging smiles with the intrigued onlookers. Harry couldn't help but laugh as she got into the car. My performance was exceptional. It's a really well done job. I suppose you'll be waiting for an engagement ring now, but that's a matter of another time. Take your time. I kept a steady pace, holding off the opponent until we reached the Tennessee River. At this point, I decided to slow down a bit. The drive along Highway 72 towards Huntsville was pleasant, although not ideal for a demonstration. Just two hours later, we were comfortably settled in the land of dreams. William, all the persons present in the hut that evening were served today. What do you mean by served? This is a legal case that is commonly referred to as malicious behavior contributing to the breakdown of a marriage. Is it possible that something like this really existed? It seems that all the necessary criteria have been met. Their actions were deliberate, excessive, and resulted in significant emotional upheaval for you. Most likely this is the reason my wife was worried. What do you mean by saying that your wife was upset? My daughter Linda contacted me today and informed me that Donna needed to talk to me. There was a serious problem at her workplace, and she somehow got involved in it. I don't have any additional information at the moment. A lawsuit has been filed against Glenn Simpson and Gilbert Industries demanding the payment of a huge sum of $1 million. At the same time, the other 11 people involved in the case received $100,000 each. I don't want to sound condescending, but do you sincerely believe that this plan has a chance of success? Of course, this may not be the easiest way, but I think there is potential for an intriguing development here. As we were leaving the restaurant, I felt anxious, so I casually suggested to Harry if she would be interested in renting a room and meeting in the morning. Although I would love to, but unfortunately I can't do it. If you're interested, we can leave earlier than planned. However, this is not the main issue. Why don't we just leave? I will provide you with all the necessary explanations during our journey home. There was silence in the car for the first 20 minutes, but eventually a conversation ensued. About eight years ago, Harry weighed almost 300 pounds. 
Instead of opting for bypass surgery, she decided to focus on diet and exercise. As a result, she successfully lost 140 pounds. Unfortunately, she now has to deal with 20 pounds of sagging skin. Having undergone five surgeries to remove excess skin, Harry wears traces of his journey all over his body. Despite her courageous and open nature, she admits that she is very shy of these scars, which is why she avoids communicating with potential partners and even male friends. Strangely, she finds solace in my company, although she cannot understand why. Walking her home and walking her to the door, I kissed her gently on the cheek. At parting, I thanked her for the treat, and a single tear glistened in her eyes. We continued our platonic walks, finding satisfaction in our agreement. The local community showed a strong attachment to Nick Jack's markets, as evidenced by their popularity. Exceeding expectations, the business expanded within two years, opening two more stores and not going to slow down. The owners showed genuine interest in appointing me inventory manager at all three establishments, offering me a full-time position. At the same time, they stressed the need for my transition to a permanent job and demanded that I obtain a legal status. At this point, the details no longer mattered, and I agreed. Both Harry and I were glad of this outcome. Several more weeks passed without hearing from my daughters, until I finally received a short message. It said that mom had been fired from her job. This unexpected event has complicated our situation. Before that, I had a stable job with a decent income, and Donna was employed. But now that she was no longer working, I began to fear the possible consequences of this for our upcoming divorce. But to my surprise, there was positive news. Harry informed me that three of the eleven people we were suing decided to settle the case. What does it matter? Since we only demanded a refund of $100,000, the insurance companies offered to settle the case privately in order to avoid a public trial. Since the insured event was covered by their insurance, it did not lead to large financial losses for them. So, you're saying that we'll get some funds? William, I've already received three checks, perhaps another one is on the way. Do you think this has to do with Donna's dismissal? Of course it's possible. Could this negatively affect my divorce process? Have you submitted all the necessary documents yet? Not yet, Harry replied with a smile. I was just about to ask you for help. After hearing this, I was instructed to pack a small bag and prepare the applicant, as they were planning to visit his wife. The departure was scheduled for early Thursday morning, and excitement filled the air, and I couldn't help but smile. At six in the morning, we set off, arriving at the Sheraton Hotel after a ten-hour drive. Wanting to surprise Linda, I immediately called her and made an appointment for lunch at the Reading Motor Inn the next day, also inviting Donna and Lara. When we sat down for lunch, the conversation turned out to be a little awkward, but nevertheless it covered a wide range of topics. We tiptoed around the inconvenient truth, deliberately avoiding acknowledging the obvious problem. After a year of friendship without any romantic relationship, we finally decided and spent our first night together. Most of all, I was worried about making sure she didn't feel uncomfortable in this situation. Although I won't go into the details of the evening, I can say with confidence that it turned out to be far from as traumatic as we expected. We were both a little out of it, but we managed to handle the situation with a positive result. Relief showed on her face. She knew that I didn't find it disgusting, and I was glad that it wasn't as terrible as she imagined it would be. We were a couple of blissful enthusiasts. When the sun came up, we gathered for a delicious brunch. Donna and our daughters were already sitting at the table, looking forward to our arrival. I put on one of my newly purchased jackets, complementing it with an elegant dark turtleneck. I must admit I looked very respectable. Harry, on the other hand, was dressed in a light business suit, radiating professional ease. My wife and daughters looked at me in amazement. I was proud to introduce Harry Parker, my trusted confidant and lawyer, to Donna. I was sitting at the table with Linda and Laura, my daughters. The atmosphere was a bit uncomfortable, but I tried my best to make the most of it. 
Before we could engage in meaningless small talk, the waiter came over to take our orders. Personally, I didn't have much appetite. If you don't mind, I'll just have a cup of coffee, I said politely. Donna, sensing the tension, was the first to break the silence. Looking around the table, I realized that everyone was on the same wavelength. Why don't you bring us five cups of coffee and leave the pot on the table? I suggested, hoping to ease the awkwardness a little. The waiter nodded, and a collective sigh of relief seemed to sweep over all of us. It's good to see you again, Bill. Do you want to share what you've been doing lately? Donna's lips curled into a faint smile as she spoke. Personally, I've been focused on my job, giving you the opportunity to explore and discover yourself, or whatever it is you're doing. Harry surreptitiously nudged me under the table. I needed your support, and you left me, she muttered. Maybe you needed someone, but not me. Let's not waste this reunion just poking fun at each other, Mom and Dad. I'm sure that's not the only reason you arranged this meeting. Linda's persistence made me think about the purpose of our meeting. Looking forward to a short meeting, I felt unsure of what to do next. Looking for a clue, I glanced surreptitiously at Harry, hoping to get at least some indication. But Linda ignored my presence and took the conversation into her own hands. Meanwhile, Harry rummaged in her purse, took out an envelope, and handed it to Donna. Addressing her as Mrs. Smith, Harry handed over the divorce petition, emphasizing its fairness. I recommend that you take it to your lawyer for a thorough examination. Laura and Linda looked amazed, clearly caught off guard by this suggestion. Donna, on the other hand, smiled broadly. She refused to take the envelope from Harry, preferring instead to get one from her purse. You stupid imbecile. I legally divorced you eight months ago because you left me. I never sent you a copy because I didn't have your address. This is the final end. I don't have anything that I could falsely claim, she said, and her smile turned into a wide grin. Just as Donna got up from her seat, the waiter appeared with coffee and a luxurious vase for our table. She took an unusual look at the girls and left, leaving both envelopes. Dad, can we stay for lunch? Lara asked, mentioning the supposedly excellent quiche in this establishment. Harry and I giggled and asked the waiter to bring us the menu. Harry, Laura, and Linda enjoyed a delicious lunch and a fascinating conversation. Meanwhile, I felt a sense of loneliness, as if I were dining alone. Understanding women has always eluded me. The girls exchanged phone numbers, promising to keep in touch. When we returned to the room, I started to pack my things. Unexpectedly, I thought about what could prolong our stay here. But our stay in this particular place will not last long. Time was running out, so I hurried to get ready. An hour and 30 minutes later, we were in Elkton, Maryland. Another 30 minutes passed, and we arrived at our destination. Harriet Parker had undergone a transformation and was now named Harry Smith. We stayed overnight in Luray, Virginia, where we stayed in a house with a spacious three-car garage. But that's a story for another time. The girl, who remained unnamed, reported that Donna had a breakdown when she found out that I had received a staggering sum of more than $2 million from Gilbert Industries. For unknown reasons, Donna decided to move to Iowa. Unexpectedly, but I didn't know anything. In fact, it was quite the opposite. I was well aware that our love life had become monotonous, limited to the predictable three times a weekend. I wanted to add a twist to it, but I had no idea what was waiting for me. My brother, Doug, gave me a camera with a doorbell. Glenda was unhappy with his appearance. She was very proud of our Victorian house and thought that the camera would break its historical charm. On the other hand, I cherished the vintage aesthetics of our 80s home. Glenda expressed her displeasure by pouting, but I reassured her, urging her not to violate the authentic look. As a result, the camera remained untouched on my dresser, waiting for an opportunity when I could discuss its presence with Doug without seeming to refuse. Little did I know that over time, she would become an essential part of my plan to revitalize our lives. That evening, I moved the doorbell camera from the dresser to the bookshelf opposite my bed. Glenda noticed her new location, 
and questioned her presence. I explained that she was just bothering me on the dresser. I decided to temporarily put the gift that my brother gave us in a safe place while I think about what to do with it, and at the same time not upset him. I wanted to make sure that he wouldn't feel offended when he found out that we didn't keep his gift. I assured her, and she seemed pleased with my answer. The next day I bought exactly the same device. After opening it, I made some changes to make its functionality meet my needs. I carefully turned off the alarm bells and speakers, disconnected the LED indicators, and then connected it to a power source using a plug cable. Later, I swapped the cameras and surreptitiously ran a power cable through the back of the bookshelf. As a result, a motion sensing camera is now installed in my bedroom. I interfered with the device's Wi-Fi connection, which allowed me to access it remotely via the internet. This allowed me to receive the same notifications that usually come at the front door. However, the internal speaker was turned off, so there will be no sounds or messages if I do not respond to the alarm. The recordings from the camera will be stored in my cloud storage. I thought this would allow us to get some stimulating videos that we can enjoy later. Looking back, it was a stupid plan. At first, everything seemed promising, but over time, everything changed, although not immediately. I spent a whole week making the necessary changes to the camera and installing it discreetly in the bedroom so that Glenda wouldn't suspect anything. Finally, on Monday, everything was ready for work, just when I had to leave before Thursday. The thought of catching Glenda enjoying her toys made me chuckle. But as the day went on, I noticed countless alerts triggered by Glenda's usual actions in the bedroom. Overwhelmed, I gradually lost interest in tracking every signal. After a few drinks at dinner, fatigue got the better of me, and I collapsed on the bed and fell into a deep sleep. On Wednesday evening, I finally had the opportunity to view the videos stored in the cloud. I decided to skip the video from Monday morning until 10 a.m. when I left for the airport. Throughout the day, my wife was constantly coming in and out of the bedroom, but something caught my attention around 2 o'clock. There was a man I didn't recognize, and I watched as my wife gently touched his hands, looking at him with a desire that I couldn't comprehend. Curious, the man asked her when I would return from my trip. Running his hand over Glenda's beautiful body, he asked, And when will your husband return to the city? Glenda, smacking her lips, replied in a seductive tone, Thursday. Next week we will return to the usual schedule, but you don't have to hurry to leave today. You can even stay the night, she said, pulled his head to her and kissed him passionately. Now take it off, she ordered. I watched in shock as my devout religious wife performed explicit intimate acts with a stranger. I quickly pressed the rewind button, realizing that I was staring blankly at the screen. I assumed that they repeatedly left the room to eat and take a shower, but I didn't pay attention to it. Everything I've observed so far has stunned me, and I hurriedly rushed to the bathroom to induce vomiting. I paused the video and decided to go out and buy a bottle, any bottle. There was a bourbon in the nearest liquor store and I took it. By the time I returned to my room, a quarter of the bottle had already been drunk. Upon entering the room, I noticed a flashing message light on the phone in the room. Grabbing my cell phone, which was charging on the table, I saw that Glenda had called several times. I got a phone call at the hotel, and to my surprise, it was Glenda. She was worried about the time of my flight tomorrow and seemed upset that I wasn't answering my phone. I couldn't help but wonder why she was upset. Checking my phone, I noticed that her messages were getting more and more irritated because she couldn't reach me. Curiosity made me download my laptop and watch the videos from the moment she first called. To my surprise, I found another man in the footage. But on the other hand, my brother won't feel rejected because I didn't take advantage of his gift. It was him, in bed with Glenda, completely naked. The first fragment of the video shows them entering a room clasping their hands in an embrace, and then falling on the bed. It is worth noting that they were completely naked. At that moment, Glenda reached for the phone, urging Doug to be quiet. 
She felt the need to clarify if my plans had changed. She was dialing a number with one hand and stroking the injured dog with the other. They had just finished their lesson. Annoyed, she left the first message with an annoyed expression on her face. Doug was undoubtedly already showing interest, but Glenda wouldn't let him pester her. No, she insisted. He'll call back, and I don't want us to get distracted. I watched as Doug persistently urged her to try again, but she resisted and continued to leave numerous messages. Her dissatisfaction with me grew with each unsuccessful attempt to contact me. In the end, she resorted to using the phone at the hotel. I skipped most of the scene, ignoring Doug's desperate pleas during phone calls. Eventually, my younger brother Dougie got bored, and my brother leaned back against the headboard, clearly annoyed. To my surprise, he suddenly directed his gaze directly at the camera. I quickly stopped the playback and rewound it, stopping right in front of his index finger. Hey, he exclaimed, why is my present on your bookshelf? Glenda stopped her attempt to dial the number and mockingly told Doug, This is the stupidest gift in the world. Are you sure you want Bobby to keep a record of everyone who goes in and out of this house? Doug's expression turned confused when he finally realized what was going on. Oh no, definitely not. She'll stay there until he figures out how to refuse your gift without offending you. She continued to dial the number. What a stupid and ignorant man, she muttered. It took me a moment to realize that she was referring to Doug, not me. I pressed the rewind button again. Suddenly, the rewind stopped and I realized that I was watching a live video broadcast. Feeling the need to act, I grabbed the phone and dialed the house number. It seemed like the only logical thing to do. The visible disappointment and irritation on the faces of both justified my decision. Glenda let out a series of expletives, then repeated them before interrupting my brother's class to answer the phone. She silenced Doug and then answered, Oh, Bobby... She had an innocent expression on her face. I was very worried when I couldn't reach you. Where have you been? Oh, I'm sorry. My phone is dead and I accidentally left the charger in the room. Despite the fact that we worked diligently all day, we managed to finish the work ahead of schedule. Now I'm rushing to the airport in the hope of catching a flight home. If I hurry, I can arrive in an hour. We will contact you later. I'm done talking. Glenda expressed her disappointment with even more explicit expressions. You must leave immediately, she urged my brother. He tried to hold her back, hinting that we had enough time for a quick meeting. Are you crazy? She exclaimed, jumping out of bed. Your brother thinks he can be here in an hour, but it's only 30 minutes to fly. I have to wash the sheets and everything else. In a timid voice, she muttered, Oh my God, and began to take off the bedclothes. My estranged brother was hurriedly getting dressed. In a fit of apathy, I stopped the live broadcast, devoid of any anxiety. All I craved was bourbon. This moment required an additional portion of the amber liquid. I had no desire to make any attempts to return home. When she called, I planned to tell her that there were no flights and that I had just returned to the hotel. Everyone else did the same. I decided to withhold any information until I meet with a lawyer. I watched the previous videos and found that the mysterious man who appeared on Monday tried to convince Glenda to invite him on both Tuesday and Wednesday. But Glenda stood her ground, assuring us that this was a one-time occurrence and that we would return to the usual schedule in the new week. But it turned out that this is not just a one-time occurrence. These strange daytime gatherings turned into evening gatherings, becoming a new norm for Glenda. Watching Tuesday's videos, I expected to see my brother Doug, as the mysterious man was rejected. But to my surprise, it wasn't Doug. Instead, two brothers appeared in the frame, who turned out to be the sons of our neighbors. These college students seemed ready to skip their classes for the whole day. Glenda pampered them with all her intimate suggestions and satisfied their desires. Meanwhile, they rested on my bed while she diligently prepared lunch and dinner, which they devoured right there. Surprisingly, she strictly forbade me to eat a simple chocolate bar in bed. Oddly enough, it bothered me more than any physical signs of aging. It's amazing how naive and controlled a person I was. 
While I was finishing the last drops of bourbon, my wife was engaged in intimacy with her brothers. Just thinking about it made me lose my appetite. But I desperately clung to the alcohol in my stomach. It was impossible to believe. Who was the woman I married? I fainted from the bourbon and, frankly, from boredom. I was just not interested in watching promiscuous relationships. Glenda contacted me later. When I woke up, I lied and said that there were no flights and that I had fallen asleep at the hotel. After finishing the conversation, I saw my wife expressing displeasure, trying to get Doug back. But he had already returned home to his wife and refused to return. Not satisfied, she contacted our gardener and expressed uncertainty about the meeting the next day. Thursday was the day he used to take care of our yard and, I suppose, my wife. I closed the site and left in a daze. In a hurry, I got to the liquor store just before it closed and managed to buy another bottle. Fortunately, I fell asleep before I had too much to drink. I didn't want to hurt myself. The next morning, suffering from the worst hangover I've had since college, I downloaded some videos. I carefully selected those that demonstrated the most exciting actions. I sent the appropriate ones to Doug's wife and parents, and, hopefully, I can share them on my gardener's wife's Facebook page. After that, I decided to go to my wife's Facebook page and shared a video that I made using various clips. When I left, I changed her password. Thinking that this might bring joy to her parents as well, I indicated their email address. After that, I packed my things and went to the airport, setting up a meeting with a divorce lawyer that day. Throughout the day, I ignored the constant calls from my wife and our families. Their concern didn't matter to me, probably under the influence of bourbon. Maybe it was my wife's lack of respect, or maybe it was my own self-loathing, but I felt detached and indifferent. I tried not to wonder what was wrong with me, that my wife freely bestowed her affections on neighbors, brother, gardeners, and even a stranger, while I limited myself to modest, intimate meetings. Even on Fridays, I wasn't sure who would honor me with their presence. I hoped that the weekend would be set aside for more intimate relationships, which I have always treasured with Glenda. Arriving at the airport, I quickly hailed a taxi to take me to the lawyer's office. The thought of having to face Glenda was frightening, and I was eager to learn about the possible options. It was then that I was offered the services of Ralph Thurston, an experienced lawyer in his 60s, who proudly claimed to have witnessed every conceivable scenario. After watching my videos, his look changed. When I was telling my story, he was visibly upset when I mentioned that I had sent videos to others and posted them on Glenda's Facebook page. He highlighted the potential consequences to which I had unknowingly exposed myself. Worried, he paced around the room, expressing his concerns. Even though the emails could not be recovered, he insisted on fixing the damage done to my wife's Facebook page. Perhaps, he reflected, no one had seen her yet. Determined, he led me to his computer, forced me into a chair and told me to log in to Facebook. In the end, we resorted to deleting my wife's entire Facebook account. Ralph wasn't sure if this action would eliminate all the evidence, but it seemed to be the most cautious approach. It was recommended that the videos be no longer distributed and that no further retaliation be sought. Bobby, given your vulnerable position, such actions will do more harm than good. Ralph sat down in his seat when I got up from the chair and looked at me intently. I will provide you with a list of actions that you should take. Therefore, I devoted a significant part of my day to visiting banks and my office to separate our finances and exclude her presence from all relevant policies. In our HR department, I ran into a problem that made me feel disappointed. It turned out that to exclude a spouse from the 401k, his consent is required. However, this issue may be resolved in court. After dealing with the bank, I decided to visit my sister Cheryl. Since her children were at school, I knew she would have some free time. Her reaction was shocking when I shared my story, especially when she found out that our brother was one of those with whom my wife betrayed me. When I mentioned that Ralph had offered to invite a witness during the confrontation with Glenda, Cheryl agreed to accompany me. Without her support, 
I probably wouldn't even have thought about returning home. I led a nomadic lifestyle, constantly on the move, and my things were packed in a suitcase, which now gave off a distinct smell of bourbon. It looks like I made a mess the night before, clumsily spilling bourbon all over my stuff. When we arrived at my house, I noticed Jose and Luis, who were busy mowing the lawn. Then it dawned on me that I mistakenly sent the video not to his wife, but to someone else on Facebook. Filled with annoyance, I impulsively grabbed a rake and threw it in their direction, shouting for them to leave immediately. Get out of here! I shouted threateningly. They wasted no time, quickly jumped into their car and drove away before I had finished my threatening words. In their haste, they abandoned them, and it was clear that they had no intention of returning if they valued their own lives. Glenda stood by the door, her eyes swollen and filled with tears. I assumed that she either saw the video I sent to her parents or came across it on her Facebook page. I'm sorry, Bobby, she said, her voice shaking. I didn't mean to offend anyone. Before she could say a word, my sister angrily intervened. The whole neighborhood seemed to witness the intense drama unfolding in my yard. Our brother trusted you and you think that doesn't mean anything? My sister accused Glenda. Fatigue from the events of the last two days quickly overcame me, and laughter turned into tears. Gathering my strength I tried to pull myself together, because I didn't want anyone to witness my emotional breakdown on the doorstep. Just at that moment, my neighbor's wife looked over the fence, but she quickly retreated when my sister noticed her and started screaming. The sister's voice trailed off as the woman disappeared, no longer punishing her two sons. She didn't seem to see any reason to continue anymore. I got up and went into the house to pack my things. Glenda walked behind me and Cheryl followed her. Glenda was fidgeting with her hands, pleading, Please, Bobby, please, I love you. Cheryl patted her on the back of the head and hissed, Shut up, shame! Glenda stood in the doorway of our bedroom and watched dejectedly as I packed my things. I took our wedding photo from the dresser, stared at it for a moment, and then looked at Glenda. I slammed the photo against the edge of the dresser, causing the glass and the broken frame to scatter on the floor. Glenda let out a mournful cry of pain. After carrying the first two suitcases to my sister's car, I told her to fill another one with the contents of my dresser drawers. My wife tried to follow me, but I responded with a sharp growl, demanding that she not interfere with me. She collapsed at the bedroom door while I was going downstairs. When I returned upstairs, I found Glenda still lying on the floor, looking at me pleadingly and again insisting that it was insignificant. The realization hit me like a wave. It deprived me of intimacy. In a fit of anger, I let out a scream, and clenching my fist, rushed to her. The thought of hitting a woman had never crossed my mind before, but at that moment it seemed dangerously close. But then my sister intervened, quickly grabbing my hand and wrapping me in a tight hug. Don't do this, Bobby. She's not worth it. She's just a frivolous person. Let her go, she begged, her voice full of worry. Glenda burst into tears again, but at that moment I realized that I had no love or sympathy left for her. You have until next Tuesday to leave this house. I will inform the landlord that our relationship is over. I'll start moving my stuff this week. Move yours or I'll get rid of them, as well as our wedding photos, I announced, my words sounding a mixture of anger and determination. After collecting the rest of the clothes and luggage that we packed, I took them to the car. Before I left, I decided to knock on my neighbor's door. Unfortunately, there was no response, so I raised my voice and asked, did you like the video? I'm thinking of taking it to the college and showing it to the dean. As I got into the car, I heard loud voices coming from the neighbor's house. Feeling exhausted and tired, I leaned against the door. Cheryl looked at me and asked a question that I didn't have an immediate answer to. My parents didn't try to justify Glenda's actions. My father's comment was completely disgusting, and my mother's remarks were twofold. But let's remember that they're just boys, I said to Donnie, Daryl, and the gardeners. As a result, we decided not to hire them anymore. As for my brother Doug, whom I considered the worst offender, Bobby, it was just one mistake. 
After all, everyone can make mistakes. He's your brother. Yes, I am his brother and she is my wife. But what happened was not a mistake or an accident. His inappropriate actions towards her were deliberate. I forced myself to yell at my parents. My father showed a sense of shame. So, Bobby, he began again. He's your little brother. You have to treat him with understanding. I didn't hear the rest of his words. As I was leaving, I stopped, turned to face my parents and said, You're wrong. I don't have a brother. And if it goes like this, soon I won't have any parents at all. Closing the door behind their astonished stares, I turned off the phone. When I turned it back on to check my work messages, I noticed several messages from Blenda and one from my sister-in-law, Megan. I also got a message from Doug. While dealing with several messages at work, I deleted all of Glenda's unread messages before listening to Megan's message. When Megan's voice rang out, she introduced herself and sobbing, expressed her emotions. Seeing her pain, I felt deep remorse for sending her the video. The question is, why? It echoed in my mind as I realized how my actions had affected Megan's happiness. Despite her quiet sobs, Megan abruptly ended the message. The question haunted me, making me think about my motives. Being offended by Doug and wanting him to get hurt, I didn't think about the consequences for Megan. She didn't deserve to be caught in the crossfire of my actions. Megan came from a farming family. Her parents died, leaving her and her three brothers to inherit. Her siblings diligently managed the farm and did all the necessary work, but they did not forget to share the profits equally with their beloved sister. As the youngest, Megan had an attractive and innocent face radiating kindness. At a modest height of five feet one inch, when Jag introduced Megan to others, frivolous jokes were made about her that she was as pale as she was tall. But that was far from the truth. Despite her strong physique, Megan did not match my personal preferences. On the contrary, Glenda, with her slender and graceful figure, fit perfectly into my warm embrace. Every time I hugged my daughter-in-law, it felt like I was trying to lift a bulky barrel. She had a sturdy build and resembled the trunk of a seasoned oak rather than a fragile willow. At the same time, her inner nature was incredibly kind and gentle. Not a single cruel or insulting remark came out of her mouth. Over time, our friendship with her grew stronger, and our whole family unanimously agreed that she was an angel among us. But now I know the truth. It was Doug and Glenda's voices, but I was the only one who threw hurtful words at her. Self-loathing overwhelmed me when I listened to Doug's message in which he called me a pathetic fool. You just had to send that video to Megan and ruin my marriage. Even your spouse can't stand your presence. On the contrary, she admires my company and appreciates my qualities. I don't want to go into the details of their conversations, so I deleted the message without listening to the end. Suddenly the phone rang. When I saw that it was Megan, I quickly replied with an apology. No, Bobby. I'm sorry I snapped at you. I understand that it's not your fault that you're in pain, she said, lowering her voice. I know it's Doug and Glenda's fault. It's just heartbreaking, Bobby. How could they do this to us? Do they really love each other? Does he still love me? I could hear Megan sobbing on the other end of the line. I'm not sure about Doug, but it looks like Glenda is just illegible, I said with more force than I intended. Sweet Megan immediately rushed to defend her friend. She believed unshakably in the goodness inherent in people, absolutely no doubt about it. It was as if she believed that love was the only possible outcome between them. I couldn't help but burst out laughing. The laughter continued, unrestrained. In the end, I managed to pull myself together and respond, noting that, apparently, she feels great love for the whole world, given the available facts. I shared with her the videos I didn't have time to send with the twins and the gardeners. I completely forgot to mention meeting a random guy on Monday. I was thinking about how to reveal the identity of the mysterious man. Megan was shocked by my revelations, but her formal side was more pragmatic than the rest of us. Bobby, don't you think we should get checked for sexually transmitted diseases? We can't be sure that she could have been infected. 
It's amazing that this thought didn't occur to me earlier. Just the thought of syphilis or gonorrhea made me shudder. And then the terrifying thought of incurable AIDS or herpes invaded my thoughts. You're absolutely right. I need to go to the nearest clinic immediately. Bobby, could you accompany me? I don't want to deal with this alone. Her voice was full of despair as she spoke on the phone. After assuring her, I promised without hesitation to join her. As I drove up to Doug's house, I briefly wondered about his whereabouts, hoping to avoid any encounter with him. Instead, Megan's three brothers emerged from the front door. Although some consider Icelanders to be the tallest, the Swedes are undoubtedly the leaders. Despite Megan's small stature, her brothers matched the height of the tallest Swedes. At six feet two inches tall, I felt like a child compared to these formidable men. Not only were they physically imposing, but they also led a hard life working on the farm in grueling 12-hour shifts. Despite the fact that I always found a common language with them, their piercing looks made me doubt that I should stay in the car. Nevertheless, I plucked up the courage, got out, and without asking about my brother's whereabouts, they just walked past me, carrying the boxes to their car. Megan met me at the door and informed me that her brothers had moved her back to the farm. Curiosity got the better of me, and I couldn't resist asking, Where's Doug? Deep down, I didn't really want to find out. Just the thought of meeting him or Glenda again made me worried. Not knowing what to do in such a situation, I desperately wanted to avoid any meeting. I don't know, Megan replied. When he came home, I was already lying on the couch in tears. When I asked him why, he just shrugged. When I told him that my brothers intended to harm him, he hurriedly packed his bag and left. Thinking about that morning, I suddenly remembered how my parents skillfully led me away from the kitchen. It looked like there was a hole, and I knew that in the future I would have to fix it. Megan noticed how my jaw tightened, and my face frowned as thoughts of my brother popped into my head. She stood on tiptoe and hugged me tightly, urging me not to let this situation tarnish my beautiful personality. She reminded me that I shouldn't let others put me down. Before letting go, she kissed me gently on the cheek. It struck me that even when she was going through her own grief, she still put the well-being of other people first. Silently, I walked her to her car and took her to the clinic for tests. Later, when I drove her home, her brothers had already finished loading into the truck, ready to take her home. I offered to treat them to lunch, and Megan accepted my offer. The brothers reluctantly joined us, their eyes full of resentment towards me. During the meal, I told them about Glenda's action, and their anger gradually turned to expressions of sympathy. Then it dawned on me that Megan was considered a victim, and I was despised as an inadequate husband. To my horror, I realized that even my own brother was involved with my wife. Gunther, the older brother, asked about my plans for Doug. I informed him that I didn't have a brother, but other than that, I didn't know what action to take. As I said these words, there was a flash of recognition in his eyes that marked me as a weakling. I tried to clarify my position. By resorting to physical violence or causing financial damage, I would only isolate my family. And in retrospect, it might not even have been a legitimate concern or would have had any negative consequences for Megan. Their financial obligations, like those of most married couples, were divided between them. Damage to one will inevitably cause damage to the other. Similarly, trying to publicly shame or discredit him because of his infidelity would reflect badly on both Megan and me. Especially on me, I thought. I felt depressed under the scrutiny of Megan's brothers. Anger was building in me, and thoughts of cruel retribution came into my head. But deep down I knew that resorting to physical violence was not an option. I didn't want to risk my freedom or endanger what little I had left. As these thoughts engulfed me, I realized how whiny I must have sounded. I've been obsessed with this problem ever since I came across the first incriminating videos. Despite the emotions that overwhelmed me, I could not find anything positive in the desire to take revenge on the men with whom my wife betrayed me, except for temporary satisfaction. 
My lawyer stressed that by making publicly available the videos I had made, I would only harm myself. The only solution to the problem with Glenda was a divorce, but given that she didn't have a job, in the end it would mean that I would still support her lifestyle through alimony. Megan took my hand and gently brought my face to hers. You are a man full of love, she said softly. Throughout your life you have consistently chosen the right actions, demonstrating your strength. I understand that you may feel anger towards your wife, brother and other men. But I also believe that you are able to rise above all this. You have the power to find your own way without stooping to their level. When she wrapped me in another hug, I couldn't help but vent my emotions, and tears flowed freely through her hair. This vulnerable moment, albeit unconventional, brought a sense of liberation and solace. Megan's brothers looked away, feeling embarrassed by the display of emotions that did not correspond to social norms. But Megan's point of view resonated with me. I realized that I wasn't ready to sacrifice what was left of my own life for people who weren't even worth my attention. Despite the alimony, Glenda would have to look for a job. She didn't like it because she had never worked before and didn't like being told what to do. Also, although I couldn't publicly post the videos, I was confident that I could discreetly distribute them to her colleagues at any job she found. Perhaps this will finally satisfy her desires for a more intense, intimate life. As for the other men, I wish them nothing but unhappiness, although Megan and I could also suffer the possible consequences. So, I understand that people can expect revenge and retribution from me to those who offended me, but frankly, it's not worth it. Wiping away my tears, I smiled at Megan. She was right. I'm better than this man. Returning the smile, Megan and her brothers left the restaurant. At this time, Gunther paused and watched me while I settled the bill. His expression didn't look approving. You may be above that, he grinned, but we're not. With a sinister grin, he left. His body was twisted, his face was buried in his knees, and his hands were tightly tied behind his legs. Naked and shivering, he felt cold. Sven broke the silence by announcing his awakening. Focusing his gaze, Doug saw three brothers towering over him. Gunther, flanked by Eric and Sven. Gunther dropped to the ground and hit his brother-in-law hard in a vulnerable spot. Panic gripped Doug. He desperately begged, No, no, God, please, no! Trying to calm his fears, Gunther assured him, Consider yourself lucky. The pain inflicted on their sister was unforgivable, and the offense required punishment. In general, Megan's three brothers dealt with Doug in their own way, after which Doug ended up in the hospital. But I'm not interested, because I don't have a brother. It's been three years since that moment, and I'm happily married to Megan, who adores me, just like I did her. And my unfaithful ex-wife has never found a decent job and works as a waiter in a restaurant, which Megan and I often visit.